This is a production of Cornell University. Yes, as we, uh, we start the third episode here of our Cornell Turf show, Fastest 30 Minutes in Turf. Uh, thanks everyone for stopping by. Uh, for our live attendees, just a quick poll on, on where you guys are located. Um, it looks like everybody on, in the live audience here is from the Northeast. So uh, good for us to know there. We'll get that out of the way. Um, as always, we'll start with, uh, with Frank. Um, first thing with Frank, Frank's always got some, some cool stuff. Uh, you know, a little tidbit from social media. Um, kicks us off on a light note. Uh, what do you got here, Frank? All right, Carl. Thanks. So, so um, I have to tell you, golf is underway. Um, you know, people are itching. I know I work with a degenerate golfer here on a regular basis, and I know he's chomping at the bit to get out there and start playing. Uh, <laughs> well aware of all the courses opening within a reachable, drivable radius, he can go whacking it around. And of course. You know, we're all expecting this uh, this spring and, and, you know, makes you wonder, do we need to begin to adapt our golf courses to accommodate this kind of demand, right? We've long waited for golf courses to get use, and now we're lamenting uh, the use that we're getting. But one of the things that I found inspiring this week was was the young people uh, with the pet with the bags on their back you know, exercising as much as uh, playing this game of golf. And I also found a neat little piece of uh, data here. Again, visualizing data. You know, one, as we talk about using data, the ability to visualize it for people is going to be so important. And, you know, look where people play golf. You know, if you see where people play golf and, and uh, you'll see, sure. you know, this is where a lot of the interest in golf is. And, and so right before we get to you, Carl, and the, and the BMP tip, I, I came across this gem. You know, when we talk about communicating with golfers, you know, I, abs I absolutely love uh, this particular uh, graphic that somebody tweeted or put out there somewhere, uh, how you can explain uh, golf forecasting uh, to the average golfer. Uh, so... Carl, with that, let's go. Let, let me advance the slide, and it's your turn for the uh, BMP minute. Yeah. So, you know, again, uh, talking about our ERP project with the folks at RIT, uh, we came up with this infographic poster, and each week we're just going to pull a quick tip off that poster. And today's tip, you know, relates to our guest, Rich Buckley. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it's just about when we're applying pesticides, thinking about when we're applying them, and uh, focusing on, hey, when the pressure is high, we can apply then. Uh, but especially in the early spring season, we'll talk about that today, late fall season, if you don't have pressure, you know, don't apply, don't go when the pressure is low. Uh, and there's actually some cool data. I was uh, searching around on Twitter the other day and found some data on this next slide here, Frank, um, from, uh, from a grad student at Rutgers, who actually will be presenting today at the Rutgers Turf Press Symposium. Um, but it's, it's just a, a quick graph here of the, the dollar spot index, Smith Kearns dollar spot index and when they noted disease on untreated plots. And as you can see, uh, the red line here is the risk index. So when you see spikes in that, you see a slight lag, maybe one, two days, and there goes the increase in dollar spot. And, and we're talking about uh, responsible pesticide use, only applying when you need to. Uh, this is what we're talking about, looking at these models, uh, letting them guide your decision-making. Um, you know, that's, that's what we're, uh, we're focusing in on, and, and that's our BMP tip of the day. Excellent, Carl. We're going to get back to this in a minute. Don't you worry. All right, let's get through the weather here. And um, using our base 50 growing degree days, we typically start accumulating on March 15th. Uh, you can see that it's starting to happen a little bit at very low levels down where Rich is in the, in, in the metropolitan New York area, certainly in, in the Delmarva. It's well underway into the 30s. Um, and But the forecast uh, immediately... Uh, through the rest of this week into the weekend uh, is calling for not very many accumulated growing degree days. So uh, at base 50, so I, I wouldn't expect the growing season to advance. Um, I'll just make a note that uh, there are some dry areas that are continuing uh, throughout the Northeast, at least based on the last drought monitor. We'll see as it comes out um, uh, in this coming week, uh, this Thursday, probably well today <laughs> honestly the new map will probably be out all right so what kind of rainfall are we expecting in the coming week it looks pretty good for a solid shot of rainfall through 
uh, from uh, Eastern Ohio through Central PA, all the way cover in New Jersey, where really where Rich is sitting, we're expecting a pretty heavy dose. And again, Rich, we were laughing last week about how you absolutely got buried uh, in rainfall when a lot of us were talking about dry weather. Now, looking at the forecast uh, moving forward, this is the week looking out, the NOAA forecast week looking out 23rd through the 29th. Uh, on the left is the precip and looks like might be above normal in the middle of the country. Uh, much of the north, some of the northeast, you'll see the gradient there out in western New York. Some above normal, some normal, and then some below normal. Now, when it comes to temperatures across the board next week, they're expecting to warm up. Now, Art originally uh, you know, said, hey, we're going to be cooler, and it looks like we're going to be cooler a little bit this coming week. Now, what are we starting to see? Uh, <laughs> I have a Slack channel I ma we maintain with uh, the variety of projects we work on, and here was a couple from our golf Slack channel this year uh, already uh, on the left from Carl on the right from Josh Fontaine running a golf course in, in the Capital District, former technician here. Uh, you can see some really ripe looking snow mold. You know, I can see Rick Buckley already is getting excited with all, all this pathology <laughs> going on out there. But again, you know, just to remind people, this is the fourth hole at the RTJ from a couple of years ago where Dave Hicks, you know, stopped spraying, right? Sprays the fairway, but, but doesn't spray in the rough. And you see, this is one of the reasons it's very easy to see why we use pesticides. Now, uh, you know, we're not going to pass judgment, you know, about recovery and stuff like that, but certainly you don't want this stuff happening too much on your putting surfaces. Uh, your fairways, maybe like in this case, hopefully recovery will occur, but you'll also notice some mitigating factors, right? you got some shade. You can see some poor drainage here where you see some standing water uh, on the area, right? Snow mold's always going to be worse in these low lying shaded areas, even without leafing out these trees are causing some pretty significant shade problems. All right, so let's talk about the coming spring as it goes to soil temperature, because in the golf business, we use soil temperature a lot to trigger early season pesticide applications, which got my colleague, uh, Carl Scamenti, uh, worked up when he saw some uh, email alerts coming out about, hey, you know, we're promoting early season uh, pesticide use. So, um, you know, we looked at the temperatures and, and when we look at our triggers, uh, most of our triggers are 55, 65 uh, for our spring treatments. You don't see a lot of uh, soil temperatures that are earlier than that at the two inch depth. And just a reminder, you know, you're talking about still in the mid 30s, uh, upper 30s, low 40s throughout much of the region, uh, particularly to the southern part of the region. I mean, you've got to get down you know, past uh, in, into Delmarva to start to get something north of the mid 40s. No surprise there. So of course you're pretty early for your summer patch and fairy ring applications. Uh, John Inguijado was with us, with us uh, last spring and talked quite a bit about uh, summer patch and take all patch <clears throat> where he looked at cultivation and manganese treatments uh, on summer patch in Kentucky bluegrass. But one of the things we know about take all patch, different than summer patch and fairy ring, all of these are root based pathogens. All of these things are harder to control in foliar pathogens. These are much more complex, not only because of the way they behave in the soil, but the things that we apply to control these things act as drenches. Right, So you want to drench your fungicide down into the soil so it can be taken up by the plant because all of these fungicides only move up. There's only one that moves up and down. That's the phosphite pythium uh, aliette. But in general, they all move up. And so, you know, when you're treating root diseases, you want to get soil temperature right because these things break down and you want the treatment to occur near when the infection might occur. So you get maximum efficacy about the, around the product because you're gonna need control for a bunch of months. Now, take all patches one that in fact targeting that treatment in the fall seems to be better uh, than spring treatments. Now, again, this would be a bigger issue maybe on some warm season grasses where this is becoming a hellacious problem down there. And uh, especially on ultra dwarf uh, Bermuda grass greens, but also um, uh, on our bent grass surfaces up North. Now, just to get Carl going on this and Rich, uh, welcome to set you up a little bit, brother. 
you know, I poked around because I'm old enough to remember, and I know you are too, when, uh, you know, the early season applications for Dollar Spot came around. And the argument was that if you applied early, you could delay infection to the point where it might save you some fungicide applications for a foliar disease like Dollar Spot, for example. And so, you know, I poked around and I knew Kaminsky when he was at Connecticut, saw a positive result to this. I know Derek Settle in the Midwest resulted, uh, reported a positive result to this when he was with the CDGA. And I know Paul Koch also in this slide reported a positive thing that they could delay that early, uh, they could delay the time when Carl was showing all that risk. They could delay uh, the need for that. But that's not universal for all diseases when it comes to spring application. So uh, Rich, listen, welcome to the program. Uh, and uh, for those of you listening on podcast, right, you're, you're not able to see some of the things. So we hope you can join us live and look at us sometime or watching the video here. But Rich, uh, let's start out with um, what do you know and what do you hear about early season treatments at this stage for some of these diseases to maybe delay application later? Because that seems to me to be the most sketchy of these recommendations. So let's start there. All right, well, I'm just trying to make myself show up on my, my video, but what the hell. Don't I'll worry talk, about it. I'll talk anyway. Um, there, I'd search a little bit too. And most of the research about uh, the early season dollar spot applications um, came out in, in like the mid 2000s, 2007, 2008. There's a bunch of research there. Um, and the idea here is if you can suppress the dollar spot pathogen, which will be met metabolically active between about 40 and 50 degrees, you can reduce the amount of inoculum and push the disease off for a while in the spring. All well and good. Um, the research, if I, and if I can re represent James Hempfling a little bit uh, here, James found that it, it didn't make a difference. You know, in his work, the, app, the initial application timing, and he used a bunch of different parameters for that. Um, it, it didn't matter. And that, that uh, uh, after talking to him and watching him uh, do the work for a couple of years, my, uh, uh, I, my, my impression is, you're not going to get any additional advantage if you apply a material before about mid-May and following the model, the Smith-Kearns model may be the best choice because it seemed to indicate uh, a, a, an increased risk at about this mid-May time period for at least at, at, at Rutgers. And I got to tell you, Rich, the thing that comes to mind for me when we're talking like this is, you know, even since the mid-2000s, I think the pressure in the fall for dollar spot continues to be greater and greater uh, every year. And that's why I'm wondering if maybe these things might've made sense in certain, certain situations with really susceptible uh, varieties under ideal conditions during the season. And maybe now we should be rethinking this, that we've got models that allow us to predict better uh, that might also result in reductions based on what you're saying Hempling show. Yeah, I, I, well, there's, in his work, the, the most significant factor was the cultivar, right? So the new, you know, I, I, I'm from Rutgers, so it's my job to sell grass seed, but, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've, I've, over the years, I've, come, I have been more and more convinced that genetics is everything for, the, for this stuff, yeah. you know, and it, the new improved grasses, uh, it, it, for a number of diseases are good. Now, now, that being said, yeah, we, we do see more disease for dollar spot in the fall. And uh, I think the modeling is, is a great way of reducing, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the old degree day models for dollar spot are inconsistent. You know, we, we could talk about all the different types of models out there since the 80s. Yeah. But the one that shows like it, it looks like it is consistently if, uh, uh, accurate is the smith Kearns model. Right. And if you just follow the model, you know, I think you're going to save uh, treatments. And if you have better cultivars, you're going to save even more treatments. 
All right. So let me bug you uh, what I know is coming, especially as the traffic comes and maybe growth isn't happening. We're starting to mow and roll and prep the surfaces early. Uh, we usually get a flare up and people talk about early season anthracnose. You want to take a minute and talk about early season anthracnose on the putting greens and yeah. what you've learned about and taught us about with um, how some of this might be stuff carrying over. I think it carries over. I mean, the, the, uh, there's, they're polite about it in the, in the literature, talking about spring basal infections. But we, we had a conversation years ago about what's the low temperature threshold for the fungus. And it doesn't appear, one, there's not a whole lot of data. And two, it doesn't appear like it grows below maybe 60 degrees. So if you have anthracnose carrying over now, you know, it, it's very likely something from last season, and we built up enough inoculum from flare-ups last year to carry into the spring. You know, uh, um, it's treat, it's, no treat, treat, or just try to grow out of it. I try to grow out of it. I, I you know, I, 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 I'm also convinced now that that golf guys use too many fun sides. I've looked at spray sheets for 30 <laughs> years and I'm like, man, these guys are out of their minds. And I don't want to make any enemies here, but, but, uh, um, that's okay. I, nobody's listening and nobody's watching for now yeah, until they yeah. hear about what we're talking about. Then we'll yeah, have everybody it, listening. It, it's, uh, uh, I, I, I really think that if you can grow it out, that you should, you should go that way. Um, you're not going to recover the plants that are infected. They're, they're dead, dead and go anyway. And, and, uh, and we like to front load nitrogen into the system, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, instead of, uh, of using a 10th of a pound or something, you know, go 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 with your seed head suppression or something. And then you got a pound going in and, and, and we're talking about annual bluegrass here too. And, and, uh, uh, th then, then you, you have a little reserve. It's like eating a big bowl of oatmeal before I go bike ride. That's right. <laughs> so. That's right. That's right. Well, listen, now, of course, I showed some images and everybody, you know, no one needs an image, uh, particularly as with the amount of snow cover you got. Uh, did you get a lot of snow mold samples? You know, we've been curious about this. We'll probably start up the conference call next week where we'll have a little more intimate conversations about this. But what are you getting in the lab from the snow mold front, whether it's pink or gray? We, we, I've seen some of both. I've seen some, some of both. Um, not a ton. I think everyone's pretty aware with the snow cover uh, that what they've got, you know, it's an easier I, I diagnosis, uh, uh, but I've had a bunch of people send me pictures of sclerotia, you know, uh, so we have, we had gray for the first time here since 2015, you know, right outside my, my window here, I can find it. You know, I had about five weeks of snow cover, you know, so, so, uh, I, you know, I would expect, with gray, you can recover relative, you know, rake it and fertilize and just move on. With the pink, you, you know, microdochium will be active up until about June. So yeah. you may think about doing something for that. Yeah. Well, we don't live like in the Pacific Northwest, like Clint Maddox, Alec, and, and Brian up there in the Pacific Northwest at Oregon State where it's 10, 11 months of pink snow mold pressure uh, right. on your annual bluegrass along the coast. So it is important for people to understand this is uh, I think there is also good uh, resistance in the bank grasses uh, for some of the pink snow molds. And also rich uh, rolling plays a part uh, I think in some pink snow mold control. So I'm wondering, um, you know, first I'm wondering about recovery and you say gray snow mold, probably it wasn't bad enough where it's dead it'll probably if you scratch it up and get some of that Rutgers seed on it it'll be perfectly fine yeah yeah, um, yeah. I think that <laughs> yeah it will rolling and, and you know moisture management if you can in the spring um matters uh you know the the those folks in in the in Oregon are using iron sulfate too you know um maybe a little iron uh, you know they it looks like there's a little phytotoxicity there, um, but uh, uh, it, 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 a little nitrogen mitigates that issue. So, so uh, uh, you know, I, th I think there's there's options that yeah. maybe. And know, I think the big thing is now, at least on the top, you know, tops. I don't know how much people are growing yet. I haven't really heard people saying that they're, you know, growing like the Dickens yet. Um, but if they are, uh, that's probably good based on the traffic. Now, where the soil is still cool, Rich, 
uh, the roots, you know, are having a ball here. Uh, and what we tried to do, I tried to do in the intro is to say, okay, these things are complicated with regard to root pathogens as we yes. think about below the soil. Um, can you be too early with these fungicide applications? Why is it so important? You know, we hear from the pre-emergent crabgrass guys, hey, let's just get it down. We got to get it down. Why isn't it? Oh, uh, why do we want to put that application so tied to soil temperature if we put it on won't it still be there in a week or two uh yeah um but but that that's a good question um if i'll go back to dr latin's book from okay. 2011 and dr latin would suggest that the fungicides aren't effective unless the fungi are biologically active if they're met metabolizing and starting to grow and we know from lab lab work the, the, the temperature parameters that these root pathogens like Magnaporthiopsis summer patch will grow at. So we, if, we, if we can get to that window, you know, uh, you're gonna get better control. You're gonna get the growth regulator type because that's what these, these materials are, fungal growth regulators. Yeah. You're gonna get, a, you're gonna get a, a, a good uptake and a good uh, uh, response by the fungus. Now, the other thing that Dr. Latin's book would suggest is that, you know, these materials disappear from the system pretty quickly, yeah. right? And, yeah. and so, you know, you put it down two weeks ahead of time, that your oxystrobin's long gone, and the fungus hadn't had a chance to get a good drink of it yet, you know? So, so you, we, we, we really need to get into that. that the timing is, is essential, really, for these diseases. And I think, you know, what's really important, and it's not well known, you know, Paul Koch got himself to be the expert in, you know, timing of snow mold applications and how they break down and wear out, right? And, and but I got to tell you, you know, it's amazing. And we know how growth regulators work, right? Because we can measure clippings. But I often wonder why we haven't done some of this metabolism work of these fungicides that we're applying to not just encounter the organism when it's feeding, but to make sure it's in the plant providing some protection, assuming that it's just going to sit there for weeks and weeks do have you ever is does latin's book elaborate on the how the plant breaks it down because obviously it breaks down in the soil to a certain extent but it's also getting into the plant has did latin uh and boy do i love rick latin yeah. we actually just chatted with one of his former grad students john daniels our usga uh northeast rep uh on this topic uh with with Dr. Latin. So what is he, does he say anything about how the plant metabolizes these things? I think there, there's a, there's a little bit uh, about it. And I, I'm, I'm thinking of a graphic where he has, uh, you know, bioassays where he's sh showing the, the disease at different weekly intervals, uh, you know, so, so, you know, it's, it's not just measuring the soil uh, or the measuring the concentration, but he has disease work with it, you know? Uh, so, so that's some indication, but I, I, you know, there, there's probably it's probably a right uh, for some so for some research. Well, you know? I mean, here's the thing that's fascinating to me. You know, year in year out, um, we owe. I think, especially for you in the diagnostic world, it becomes a not if but when the summer patch samples will begin to come in. And I would say, it, working with you all these years, that that's somewhat tied oftentimes to heat stress and drought stress, or sometimes saturation stress, where then, you know, they're saturated because they don't drain. And then, you know, the summer patch is competing with the pythium to determine which is actually going to, you know, kill the plant. So what I'm wondering about is, have you seen a pattern over the last several years uh, in our summer patch problems that we get every year? that might be related to our lack of getting this treatment right in the spring? Or are we basically saying, listen, we got so much summer patch pressure, you could spray three drenches and it's not going to work. Where are you at on explaining this to us? Well, I, 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 there's, there's two things. And I think there's a little of both here, you know, one um, timing matters, you know, and so you have to execute well uh, when you, when you do this and, and, and you may have to, um, use the summer patch program outside of your normal program you know so execution um rates um product choice 
uh, timing, uh, the dilution rate, you know, getting it into the root zone, all of that has to, has to go right, right? Then, you know, I see guys that break through and a lot of times it's breaking through on really high end golf courses, growing POA under extraordinary stresses, you know, mowing heights at a tenth or below and, and, you know, you know, hard as a rock. And, and I think that regardless of how good your fungicide program is, uh, you know, under certain conditions, your grass isn't going to hold up. Well, and, and it's especially true, Rich, uh, you know, w- when you talk to Steve Rabideau at Wingfoot, he'll tell you the thing that he sweated out the most was keeping the rough alive for a September U.S. Open, right? Keeping, you know, three inch, three and a half inch bluegrass. We'll get into this with the lawn guys tomorrow a little bit more. But, but even keeping POA or Kentucky bluegrass alive uh, through the crap. We're not just talking about POA annua, but you're trying to grow bluegrass on these high-end joints in the summertime, Rich. That's no walk in the park, brother. No. Oh, oh no. Heck no. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least, at least he knows how to irrigate, you know, <laughs> uh, in, in home lawns and stuff. The irrigation's <laughs> all over the place. Well, but uh, let's get to this and let's wrap up here. We only got a few minutes left and I want to get your word on this root stuff because as we prepare for it over the next several weeks and probably we'll cover this topic again uh, in the webinars, irrigation amount, when you say execution, I never let any of you guys leave without sort of having a chat about how much water and do you think guys water enough? And are there, you know, we know from Kearns' graduate students work that it ain't getting very deep, even in well-designed sand-based systems with not any layers in them. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are about how effectively we irrigate these things during our execution. Uh, I don't think we irrigate enough. You know, and, and, you know, it depends on the water solubility of the product. So that's a piece of information. You know, thiophanate methyl is way less water soluble than, than a propiconazole. Hmm. And in, in, in Dr. Clark's research, you know, 30 years ago, they were using 10 gallons uh, of irrigation water, you know, uh, you know, it was two inch tall banner Kentucky bluegrass hmm. in those trials, but, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, you got to you got to spray in at least two gallons, and then I think guys ought to just do a little experiments. You know, some citizen science where they run the heads and see how much wa- root zone gets wet, and then you get an idea of how much water you have to apply to to get that, you know, that moisture through your root zone. Exactly right. right. You, yeah, you know, perfect. That, perfect. All right, there we are. Hey, Carl, we're right on the number, brother. Uh, questions or things uh, before we wrap it up. Yeah, no questions. Uh, it, it's just, it's so interesting to hear you guys talk about this stuff and, and for Rich to pull out graphics from a book that he probably read 10 years ago and to just be able to recite that, it's so interesting listening to. Uh, no questions, but maybe I'll just get everybody out of here on a note. Um, you know, I'm writing down notes about how intricate the timing of these, these programs, whether you're, it's curative for foliar disease or preventative for some of these root pathogens. There's all these factors going into the timing. Rich said timing matters. And, and I'll just make a note that, you know, uh, other ways to prevent, preventative is also, is always couched in this kind of chemical term, pesticides, but other preventative things for anthracnose, BMPs, top dressing, right? Mowing, mowing height. Um, when we're talking about choosing uh, turf uh, resistant varieties, right? That's something that, you know, timing doesn't matter. And that sets you up for a long-term future. So again, couching this and kind of reducing pesticide use we heard Rich talk about the importance of those practices and, and those are evergreen, right? Those continue to give you benefits. You don't have to worry about the minutia, all this stuff. So um, with that, thanks everybody for, uh, for attending. We got a couple uh, questions in here late, but we'll, we'll get to those uh, maybe in next week's webinar. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for attending. Third episode this year, Cornell Turf Show, Fastest 30 Minutes in Turf. For Frank Rossi, for Rich Buckley, I'm Carl Scamenti. Thanks everybody, we'll see you. See you guys. <laughs> This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.